Let's fucking podcast. This is uh, Behind the Bastards, listeners. Uh, it's a podcast about the worst people in all of history. And uh, I got I got very hyped there. So you might think this is going to be a high energy podcast episode. But uh, I am years old or something like that. And last night I went to bed at 3 a.m. Don't and tell so people how old you are. We have, to, we have to cut that because then people well, yeah, are we'll bleep s- it out. We'll bleep yeah, it out. So okay. we'll bleep I'm, it out. I'm the safety. Yeah, I, I don't even fully remember. I, I just I'm telling you right now, people, also, uh, I'm, I'm the kind of hungover age. that you get. Not because you've gotten you were drinking or doing drugs, but because you are in your mid 30s and you stay up slightly later than normal. Um, that's that's where I am right now. I'm, I'm pounding coffee. I'm trying to do better uh, and here to distract from my my a, a decrepit elderliness is Jack O'Brien, the most decrepit old person <laughs> you've ever seen. Mm-hmm. The Crypt Keeper. What's yeah. up, guys? <laughs> How are you doing, Jack? I'm doing all right. Why are That's you good. are you like seven Mountain Dews in or what's going <laughs> I'm on? I'm zero Mountain Dews in. <laughs> yeah. Um but it's still early. Yeah. Um what is it a is it a security risk to tell people how old you are? Or just uh, like I, I don't know why we why like to I... filter out disinformation. Like there's a lot of listeners who think my real name is and, you know, I don't tell that for a specific reason, but the more lies there are out there, right? Yeah. Like the, the better it is for me. Okay. Yeah. People don't like us, Jack. <laughs> but you also don't know how old you are. So I no, feel like no. it could, you could use some crowdsourced research put mm, into this. That's right. But that's then, right. Yeah. I, I was born on the bayou and they don't they don't take <laughs> notes about when you were born there. That's actually I'm actually who that Credence song was. Written that's about. true. Yeah, <laughs> that's really well, funny. it's yeah. great to be here. It's great to see both of your faces. Thank yeah. you for thank you for having me back. Good to see you. Jack attack. Jack. It's yes. the spookiest month of the year. I think we can all accept that. And on yeah. the day this drops, happy Halloween. If you're yeah, listening. happy happy Halloween, everybody. Happy oh, this Tuesday drops on Halloween. Halloween. Yeah. Happy Halloween. It's so it's exciting. Tuesday Halloween. I do it's apologize. I feel like we all are getting a little screwed there, right? Yeah, like, by Tuesday, Tuesday Halloween. Halloween. Yeah. yeah. Come Halloween, on. we need to make it be like uh, Thanksgiving, where it's always on like a Friday. Yes. But you but, get a couple of days off before and after. Yeah, exactly. But but that's not the case. Uh, so it's a Tuesday. I wish you all the best. But because we wanted to try to help make Halloween extra good, we have an episode about the man who put the spook in Spooktober, which is what I call October. <laughs> Dracula. Yes. That's right. That's right. Motherfucking. I mean, the, the title of the episode is just motherfucking Dracula, comma, bitches. But they yes. probably won't let us use that in the point. episode. Exclamation point. Thank you. I don't think we can put that on Spotify. They'll get angry. Uh, <laughs> Jack, what do you know about Dracula? I am a, a big fan of his cereal. Uh-huh. Um, I let's count Chocula, which is, I mean, honestly, Jack, a little racist. Uh, all of the all, all of the dash not all the aren't the same, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I am. Not that familiar. Like, I know there are historical roots to the character, Mm -hmm. um, but like in terms of who it's based on or what they did to have such a horrible story told about them, um, which which is what it is. I mean, it feels like it could just be like from a middle school burn book, right? Like, just like like, I heard they go into people's rooms and try and bite their neck and suck on their blood. Yeah. So I I don't know what did uh, I I'm I'm curious to learn more. Yeah, well you're going to learn way too much today. So good, that's you know, what it, I come it, here for. If you're a, you know most people I think are are broadly aware that yeah. Dracula the vampire from the Bram Stoker book and then from I don't know like a million other books and and pieces of media since uh, is based on a real guy uh, Vlad Tepes, better known as Vlad the Impaler, and we have gotten okay. over the years yeah. Yeah. Vlad the Impaler. That's right. I've yeah. always resented yeah. this guy a little bit because he took a nickname that I yeah. always wanted. Yeah. Jack the Impaler. Yeah. Yeah. I. You remember like how hard I tried to get oh, that yeah. going no, no, and, back in and, the cracked days. For the record, Jack, you're always the first Impaler in my heart, or at least Thank in the you. top like three, certainly before Dracula. Well, a lot of people say like, I don't impale that many things. 
And yeah. I would point out like, wait, have you not seen me eat with a fork? Yeah. And or, I mean, you've cooked kebab a couple of times and kebab? that was, you were impaling yeah, the shit out of some stuff. I don't generally cook it, but I will eat off of a kebab. Mm-hmm. So that yeah. gives me rights to that. But yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. I, th- I think he just got to it first. Otherwise, yeah. I, w- I would be no. You would have been introducing me as Jack yeah. the Impaler. There's a there's a lot of unfair things like that. Like the the, the Wachowskis <laughs> get credit for creating the Matrix, even though just seven or eight years later, I had an idea that was very similar <laughs> to the Matrix. So like, right. uh, who gets the credit, you know? But yeah, it's, it's unfair. Bullshit. It's unfair. Um, and, and also my version of the Matrix, all Danny DeVito. We get we get those we get those talentless hacks out of there and we go pure DeVito. It's pure it's, DeVito. It, it's pure like DeVito. a multiplicity yeah. matrix. A yes, matrix yes, yeah. sitch. It's, it's, it's multiplicity it's plus the matrix. And that's how all you DeVitos. can kind of tell things are off a little bit. Yeah. Is, yeah. This is a world of all DeVitos. Because you're like, I'm used to some Danny DeVitos, but not right. quite as many as we're getting. So well, like sure, we've heard of like you go into work and it's mostly mm-hmm. DeVitos, but yeah. not Pure not, not, DeVito. Not pure and that's DeVito. how you tell things are a little bit yeah. a little bit twisted. A little the bit robots weird have taken in this over. universe. So Dracula. Yeah. So Dracula, sorry. <laughs> before, so, we, before this becomes a DeVito Dracula, pod. Who could be ably played by Danny DeVito? Uh, oh, is based really? on a real Hasn't guy. Been? Shocking. He should be. Yeah. Uh, Vlad the Impaler. And a weird number of fans over the years have been like, you should do a Vlad the Impaler episode. And there are a lot of lurid stories about what he did. But the reason why we haven't covered him before, and we're not really going to do an episode focused entirely on Vlad the Impaler, is that he's the kind of historical bastard where like, you don't actually know if any of that's true or if most yeah. of that is true. Like every if I was just doing a Vlad the Impaler episode, every other sentence would be me being like reading a paragraph where somebody from like the 1600s is writing about an atrocity he was supposed to have committed a couple of hundred years earlier. Right. And then me going, but also maybe that's not true because it's 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 more based on these like other myths or whatever that came about in a previous age or, you know, here's all these reasons why that might yeah. not be the, that's the case. You've got these assholes he's flying the, around yeah. for some, <laughs> some reason. So there's reasons yeah. to, yeah, I, I always got the sense and I think this is why I like didn't dig into it that much yeah. is I always got, you know how Einstein gets credit for every smart thing yeah. or smart sounding thing that anyone's ever said now. They're yeah. like, well, you know what Einstein said? The definition yeah, of Einstein or insanity Tom's is doing the same thing over and over. And it's like, first of all, that's not insanity and that's not a smart thing. But second of all, Einstein mm-hmm. like never said it any of that but it's like i always got the sense of vlad the impaler and slash dracula just like got his brand was really strong like we needed somebody to be spooky and so we just gave him all the all the dark shit yeah history yeah that uh, that is probably a lot of what happened it's one of those like he was a ruler in the 1400s, which was a pretty brutal time, especially in Eastern sure. Europe. Eastern Europe doesn't have a lot of periods of time where things weren't fairly brutal, <laughs> <chill>. right? Like <laughs> it is. <laughs> um, and he's, it, but I, I don't know it, on his own. I don't know that I would qualify him as a bastard because, like, for this show, just kind of to make things narratively make sense, I, I have adopted sort of a definition where it doesn't just being a bastard doesn't just mean you're a bad person. It means you actively like made the world worse and stood out in your time as a shitty person, like. I wouldn't do a behind the bastards on a random plantation owner in the South. Right. Not because that's not a bad thing to do because it's but because like, well, what is there to say? Right. Like he was one of a bunch of people who were part of this really awful, awful system. I would do an episode on Robert E. Lee. Right. Because his the things that he was trying to do not only like extended the Civil War, made this conflict bloodier, but he was actively attempting to set this system up in a way that would allow it to like persevere longer into the future. So he was somebody who was actively not just part of a bad system, but like making things worse in his existence right okay um whereas in vlad the impaler i'm not sure if that really qualifies he's a ruler in in uh wallachia during a which is you know part of romania now during this really brutal period he definitely like all rulers in that does some horrible shit but most of the stuff about his like real horrible crimes against humanity um, some of it may be true but a lot of it is the result of propaganda from a bunch of catholic monks who were like really pissed at him because he had killed a bunch of the Germans in his country. Mm. And I don't know, you know, 
mixed bag uh, as to whether or not like it's fair or just kind of like a part of a political dispute, basically, yeah. that that is echoed down. And like anybody who is a ruler in Europe in this period is going to do some massacres. But if like you're doing the same kind of horrible shit as everybody else in the area, I don't know that I'm going to like want to cover you in behind the bastards. So what makes Tepes interesting is the degree to which is how he becomes Dracula. Right. And that is a story that involves a lot of other people's bastardry. It involves a really fascinating look into human folklore and the kind of stories that we tell about our monsters. And I think ultimately it has a lot to say about like why we are the way we are. So that's kind of the story we're going to be talking about today, how Vlad became Dracula. Um, But that is going to start with a little bit of a bio on Vlad the Impaler. So are are you ready to learn about V the MP? V the MP, I am. Mm -hmm. A little Mm -hmm. VMP action. Yeah, that's Uh, right. That's right. So Vlad was born in 1431. Maybe Uh, he may have been born as early as 1428. We're not going to know because nobody really nobody was like putting down birth certificates. I'm going to guess people didn't always know what year it was. Like if you traveled like seven miles by by foot, you probably would go to a place like, no, it's not 1428. It's 1429. Whatever. You like Uh, to keep it mysterious like you do with your birth year. Exactly. Vlad Vlad also is trying to avoid getting doxxed. Yes. (laughs) Yeah. So he was probably born in Transylvania. That part of the books is wow. likely accurate. All right. um, the town he was born in is, I'm going to do my best here, Sigiswara, um, which was then part of the Kingdom of Hungary. Hungary and Romania, I mean, Romania is not a thing at this moment as like a, an independent nation, but they're going to wind up spending quite a bit of time having a little kerfuffle over the specific area that he's born in. Mm. Eastern Europe uh, in his time was a place of chaos and violence, one in which the medieval traditions of serfdom and feudalism, they were starting to fade in the West, right? In Western Europe in the 1400s, serfdom and kind of a lot of these feudal attitudes are giving way to what's going to result in like a, a more modern concept of like states and the relationship between people and rulers Um, that's starting to happen in the West. But in the East, all of that shit is really kind of coming into its height. Right. Um, Because it's, you know, just a different part of the world. The chief powers in in Vlad's time in the area where he grows up are Hungary. That's like the big Christian kingdom, um, which was a closely related foreign kingdom to Wallachia, uh, where his dad is going to be ruling in the not too distant future. Um, Mm -hmm. And then the other heard of one of those. Yeah. I've heard of Hungary, not Wallachia. So just so everybody gets an idea of how dumb I am on on this whole thing. I, I had a friend in high school who's a Romanian national who would always insist that he was Wallachian, not not okay. just not Romanian. Like Wallachia is like the center of what becomes the state of Romania. Mm-hmm. And so the other big power in the region, you've got Hungary on one side and like the Holy Roman Empire, which is like you know kind of governing the major Christian states in that region. And then the other big power is the Ottoman Empire. And the Ottomans have not taken Constantinople yet. Um, but they're they're working on it, right? They're in the process of of making Constantinople into Istanbul. You can refer to the uh, the They Might Be Giants song if you want a little bit more information on that. Yes. It's pretty, a pretty detailed good history. history. A yeah, long exactly. read of a uh, two minute yeah. song. Yeah. yeah. So Constantinople has not gotten the works yet, um, <laughs> but the Turks are in the process. So yeah. okay. uh, they are. Making constant incursions into this chunk of Eastern Europe, they control some of the surrounding territories. And like when you read like weirdo right wing dudes with like Twitter accounts that are named, I don't know, like cultural critic or whatever, uh, (laughs) they tend to like they always like to frame this as this bone deep clash of religions and cultures that are just completely different and can never live together. That's not what anyone living through it sees it as. Right. If you are actually living in the area at this point, your life is a lot more muddled. Um, Vlad the Impaler father, who is Vlad II, who's going to wind up ruling Wallachia, he spends most of his life allied to the Ottomans, right? Like he is a an Ottoman vassal and he is also he's fighting when he goes to war. He's often fighting on behalf of Sultan Murad II. And a lot of people go back. He's going to go back and forth. His son's going to go back and forth. A lot of people in this border area are like, well, right now it looks like the Ottomans are a better bet. So I'm an Ottoman vessel. And then like, oh, now the Holy Roman Emperor seems like he's got, you know, some shit on his. He, he's got some weight behind him. So I'm going to go over there. That's just how people are, right? Like it, it, it doesn't make any sense to be super rigorous about it because that'll just get you killed. Sure. So it is uh, from the Emperor Sigismund that the family 
family gets their imposing title, Dracul. Dracul is not like a last name. It is a, a title that they are given. Um, and obviously, that's the root of the word Dracula. If, if you've seen that new movie, the, the Last Voyage of the Demeter, which is about one chapter in the Bram Stoker Dracula book where Dracula mm-hmm. travels over to this little coastal English town on a boat. It mm-hmm. uh, doesn't go well for the people on the boat. The crate that he's loaded onto the ship in has a dragon on it. Um, that's because the word Dracul means dragon. Um, although in Romanian, wow. it can also mean devil. Um, both are, it, it's kind of like, uh, it means both. Uh, and yeah, the, the reason why he gets that title is that Sigismund is trying to get Vlad the Second. Vlad the Impaler's dad and a couple of these other kings and stuff who were sort of on the fence. A lot of them kind of go back and forth between him and the Ottomans. He wants to get them locked in on his side, right? Because he's trying to build up a solid. He's trying to like make sure his power base stays solid. Um, and so he creates this knightly order called like the the Order of the Dragon. Um, and Vlad the Second is one of the guys he brings into this. And most kind of layman's histories of of Vlad the Second and of Vlad the Impaler will describe the order of the dragon this way. And I'm going I'm to quote from an article by the Warfare History Network. Quote, a group of European leaders who were sworn to defend the Holy Roman Empire against infidels. Now, again, that kind of leans into a lot of popular conceptions about how this period of time works. Some of the sources I've read kind of make it look, again, a lot more muddled. Um, there's a, a pretty interesting book on Vlad the Impaler by M.J. Tro, who is a crime novelist. And we'll, we'll we'll talk about our historian that we have as a source here in a second. But he describes the order, and he has some pretty good sources to back this up, in more mafioso terms. So mm. not this like alliance of Christians against the infidels, but more of like a system of mutual aid designed by Sigismund to tie regional rulers to him and to each other to reinforce his own power. More of like a secret society, right? Where it's like, we get this impressive title and this title will kind of bind them to me and to each other and we'll promise to like help each other out. I'm trying to make this kind of like intimate cultural bond to set us all together, Um, but more because I want them... I want them to feel like they have a sense of like owing me something, right? And they um, do because that yeah. nickname is awesome. It's a dope <laughs> like, nickname, right? Such a cool if I nickname. get to call myself the fucking dragon, yeah, yeah, I'm gonna be I'm gonna be like if Kentucky were to award me the rank of colonel, you know, if yeah. I could be a Kentucky exactly. colonel, I would I would be yeah. much more pro Kentucky than I currently am. Yeah. And you yeah. would have Yeah, the the branding is just incredible. It's and great. It's, they, they had a sense of it at the time. Yeah. I love that it was just like, well if you want to like have this cool nickname. Yeah. Then <laughs> you, you gotta can, be cool yeah. with Sigismund. Yeah. Yeah. It's like a you know, a five year old creating a club that's like the yeah. super cool ninjas. Yeah. That like you get to call yourself a super cool ninja if you yeah. uh, join up. Like, hell yeah. yeah. That's worked from the beginning of time. Yeah. Cause like I think every man, I, I think I speak for literally the entire male population when I'm like, we all want to be nicknamed the dragon. The dragon. But if it's you, kind if, of our only goal in yeah. life. Yeah. Like if, if you were to introduce yourself as the dragon, people would be like, you give yourself that nickname. Yeah. <laughs> like, right. Yeah, but if course. you're like, no, nah, man, somebody else said I'm the dragon and like they're the Holy Roman Emperor, then you're in then you're in, you know, like in like Flynn, I guess. Um, that's that's <laughs> really the goal here. And yeah. it's I don't know, it's debatably successful, but that's where they get the nickname from. Now, we have basically no real information on the kind of childhood that Vlad would have experienced, our Vlad, not Vlad II, his dad. Um, There are some things we can infer. His family was extremely wealthy. These guys are nobility, right? They're they're boyars, um, which is like what you call nobles in 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 this region um they have numerous servants and bodyguards and for most of lad's early childhood he's effectively like his dad is the governor of transylvania for hungary watching for a turkish incursion we don't know who his mother was it's possible she was like basically a a prostitute um this is not like normal in like Western Europe and whatnot, that would make him like a bastard, right? Like a right. Liter- in, in a literal sense. A that's literal not, bastard, yeah. That's not the case in this part of the world, right? Uh, Wallachian and Transylvanian culture, certainly in this period, is not very pro-woman. And so, and, and to the extent that 
it doesn't really matter who your mother is, right? What determines whether or not you are a legitimate, and that's in the parlance of the time, a legitimate son, right, in order to like inherit and stuff, is just who your dad is, right? It doesn't actually matter who your who your biological mother is. Got it. So Vlad is, his dad's actually is an illegitimate son, so it's not, one of the things about this is that there's this like quasi-aristocratic democracy thing where like winding up in charge is the result of a bunch of these other boyers supporting you having a job, so the fact that Vlad II is like an illegitimate son probably doesn't really hurt him because he's able to get a lot of support to put him in power. But Vlad Vlad the Impaler is his dad's like legit son, and he's the second son of the family yeah. under his elder brother, Mircea. Um, his youngest brother, Radu, is also known as the Handsome. Uh, and MJ Trow hell writes, yeah. quote, yeah, he's hot as hell. Um, <laughs> MJ Trow writes about his uh, about all of their upbringing, actually. Yeah. He would have had a steward to organize the servants, order the food and the wine and regulate the day. Numerous skivvies would be employed to cook, clean and sew. The male children would have learned to give orders and adopt the airs and graces expected of men that would one day rule an entire country, however small by modern standards. Yes. The one picture of. Vlad the Impaler that I've always seen, the main thing that I take away from it is that he looks like a rich guy from another era. Yeah, like, he's de- for sure. Bobbles and like just various fanciness. His hair is like, looks like it has been combed by someone who is not him for like yeah. hours a, a day. <laughs> oh, and yeah. His, the thing he's wearing makes him look like a Christmas tree ornament. Yeah. Like, that's kind of his overall vibe. Do you like vibe. his mustache? What do you think of the mustache? The mustache, I, I oh, always mustache. assume yeah. that's just from another era. Yeah. And it also looks like he might have taken one of his locks and just like put it across his yeah, upper yeah, yeah. lip. There's yeah. A, like a, there's a serious curl going on on his I'm yeah. imagining there's like a yeah. backstory to that mustache. Like if you guys have watched the, the Kenneth Branagh, Hercule Poirot movies, like yes. the second the second one opens with like the the gritty backstory of a mustache. It's amazing. <laughs> anyway, that's what I imagine. So in his book, M.J. Trow cites two historians, Florescu and McNally, uh, who write this about Vlad's upbringing. There were the usual distinctions that followed the feast days, puppet theaters, ambulant artists, acrobats, mini singers. And in summer, there were ball games, running and jumping contests and games on quadrilateral swings made of red cloth and fashioned in the form of a pyramid. In the winter, they hunted eagles with slingshots, slid slid (laughs) down the Sigiswara slopes on primitive double runner sleds, trapped hares. That is pretty cool. Hunting eagles with slingshots. Eagles with slingshots is rad. The degree of deadly skills you had to have even to be like a pampered rich kid in this yes. era is amazing. Like you're just fucking bullseyeing an eagle with your. That's so funny. <laughs> Shooting eagles out of the fucking clear blue sky with yeah, a yeah. fucking slingshot, fucking rock and a piece of uh, elastic. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, amazing. And they didn't have elastic, so it was just like a sl- like you had to swing it around and like yeah, do it yeah. David style, right? Yeah, I don't probably. Know. I think maybe they had more modern slingshots than I don't know. I'm not a slingshot expert. Yeah. Um, in 1436, the ruler of Wallachia, uh, Vlad II's brother, died of natural causes. Now, uh, he had spent Vlad's brother, had, Vlad II's brother, had had been the kind of guy whose primary focus was not pissing anyone off too much. Hmm. So he had he had tried to be friendly with the Hungarians because they're right next door, but he'd also paid tribute to the Sultan and been in a military alliance with him. And this is the kind of thing where like nobody trusts each other. So when you're in a military alliance with a guy like the Sultan, you send him a bunch of your family members, right? Your family, some other nobles, and you send them to Istanbul. And that's like your guarantee of good behavior. If you don't keep up with the treaty, they'll kill your family. You know, like that's the way it goes. Hey everyone, Robert here. I fucked this up. I, I misspoke. Uh, obviously, the Ottomans had not captured Istanbul uh, at this point, which we talk about later when they do. Uh, I believe the capital of the Ottoman Empire at this phase was Edirne. Uh, E-D-I-R-N-E is how it's anglicized. But if you keep up with the treaty, the family is a pretty good life, right? Like they're not locked in a cell or whatever. Like they're in court. They generally attend like schools and whatnot in the area. Like it can be a pretty decent experience depending on where you are. This puts Um, it in a whole new perspective that you guys made me send my kids to... Yeah, stay with Sophie while we recorded this. That is that is the case. You said in case things go sideways. I was like, okay. Yeah, in in case you just support another group of advertisers. (laughs) That's right. So, (laughs) 
Vlad the second, uh, his brother dies and he becomes the ruler of Wallachia next. Um, and he does this with the backing of Sigismund, right? Sigismund was not happy with Vlad the second's brother. He's like, this guy is in an alliance with the Sultan. I'm not a big fan of the Sultan. I want to put a guy on the Wallachian throne. Who's like my dude, right? And who I can Sigismund is Holy Roman empire. Yes. Yes. He's the Holy Roman and, and the King of Hungary, right? Got it. Um, you know, you can, he, he's a triple threat, at least a double threat, probably okay. triple. I assume there's another threat to him. Um, and Holy Roman Empire ordered the dragon. They're the ones who came up with yes, that idea to yes, let them call yes. themselves dragons. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So the family, the dragon family moves to the capital of Wallachia, Tirgoviste, and into a big fancy castle. Now, Vlad the Impaler, age six or seven, starts his knight training at this point, which is like every little boy's dream. I think we all wish we could have trained as a knight when we were six or seven. Oh, at K-N-I-G-H-T. Yeah. yeah, Okay. Also cool. But I thought like they were like, okay, you're now ready to do battle at night like a ninja. That is what he's going to wind up doing. Under cover Um, of darkness. This is this is when we do our yeah. nighttime seals training yeah it is you have to start early not just for the kid but oftentimes i'm not 100 percent sure if this is the way but i think it is the way that they do in wallachia but like even going back to ancient greece if you're the kind of dude who because of your position in society you're going to be expected to fight on horseback yeah. you are often raised like with your horse because it it takes sometimes 10 15 years to like really train a military horse to be able to because like horses don't want to fight right like they don't they don't want to charge a bunch of angry armed men that's scary for a horse so you have to it often like the these societies like this is the case with the macedonians back in the time of alexander they spend a lot of their childhoods like both kind of growing up and training with their horses so that they can fight together because it takes that long to make a good war horse yeah it's been Um, a constant struggle with me and my horse the my horse is more into the arts yep and dressage yeah. Um. And yeah, hates yeah. when I just try and ride it into a fist no. fight. No, you, know? you have you have tried to invade Persia several times, and your horse just won't <laughs> do not, it. It's not going well. It's not going well. Yeah, very <laughs> so, bad at it. This period in his life, where he's kind of living in Tirgoviste, he's he's training on being a knight. It ends pretty quickly for little baby Vlad the Impaler, because in 1437, when he's somewhere between seven and nine years old, probably the Emperor Sigismund dies. Um, and his plans to create this grand anti-Ottoman alliance kind of crumble. The whole Order of the Dragon thing. They keep the title. They're always going to use that title. Yeah, that's fucking dope. That's not going but, anywhere. You know, it doesn't really mean much in the now that Sigismund's died. And there's this like kind of right as he dies, there's a peasant uprising in Wallachia that's pretty brutal to put down, weakens them militarily. And then there's a, a wave of plagues, probably spread by rats, uh, that hits right at the same time and kills uh-huh. just a fuckload of people. So, um, you know, get rid of rats, people. It just makes sense. Now, (laughs) Vlad II, Vlad the Impaler's dad, has no choice but to make the same decision that his brother had made and bend the knee to the sultan, right? Now, thankfully, Murad II is a pretty cool dude as sultans go. He's famous for being tolerant, um, particularly of like heretical religious sects in his own country, right? There's all these like little weird religious groups that have some take on, you know, uh, 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 the, the Quran or whatever that's like kind of very much not in the mainstream and like a lot of other sultans probably would have punished them. But Murad is just kind of like interested in that sort of stuff. So he he'll give them money. He'll like support them and be like, yeah, I just am kind of curious what you're going to. I just want to let you cook, you know, like tell me some shit, you know, there's not TV back then. So maybe like encouraging heretical religious sects is kind of like funding Netflix. Yeah. Um, (laughs) See what these crazy fuckers come up with. (laughs) <laughs> He's also known as being super nice to his slaves, which is, again, kind of the del- like, are you a good person? It, it doesn't mean like not having slaves. It means are you right. nice to them, right? Are you nice to them? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, but that, that said, as that probably suggests, good dude is a relative term when we are of talking course. about medieval rulers. Yeah. And as relatively chill as Murad is, he's still the kind of dude who punishes his enemies by impaling them in mass because that's oh. just kind of how the Ottomans be, right? Everybody's got their own ways of like killing your enemies. The Ottomans, one of the things they like to do is impale. That's not, they're not the only people doing impaling, right? Impaling's popular, but we always like a good impaling. Oh, yeah. But yeah, lots of different ugly, none of the ways people kill each other in the Middle Ages are nice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> they like to really make a show of it, make yeah, a meal yeah, of, yeah. The, of the thing. 
Um, so when, when you say impale, is that just like run through with a sword or there, no, there's an no, extra it's a big element. sharp stick going going through you in a way that's unpleasant? And then gravity doing some work. Is that I think correct? gravity often. I mean, the same way that like uh, that's what kills you to an extent when you get like crucified. Right. Yeah. Is, yeah. That whole process. So do they impale you and then just like let you slide down a pole? Like, do they put it upright? Is that what when they're when we're saying someone's an impaler? Um, because I am again still trying to get the nickname to go, and I'm trying yeah. to see like what type of impaling I could do to like get this sh- yeah. shit to finally catch on. Like, is it a big wooden stick, sharp wood stick, and then mm-hmm. you put it upright, and they're just kind of like hanging there in the air? Yeah. Like yeah, in it's, Jason so it's a, X, the kill yeah, in Jason X with the screw. You kind of are letting them slide down it. It's often a punishment for like crimes against the state, right? Um, uh-huh. It is it is a particularly nasty one. So people who like it threaten sort of the stability of the government uh, yeah. often do it. There's a few different ways. Um, it's one of those things where sometimes people are dead when they do this and you're just kind of doing it as a, a, a show sure. of force. Sometimes uh, it, it's a very quick death, right? Like you're and, and there's a couple of different ways. There's like through the abdomen or whatnot, like directly mm-hmm. to the heart. There's like the reverse way. There's like putting it basically going in through the outdoor, uh, so to speak. I'm, I'm sure you can kind of guess what I'm saying there. Through the butthole. Through the butt. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And there's okay. a, you know, it can, it can be the kind of thing where like you die pretty quickly or it can be the kind of thing where it's like slow and it takes days. That sort of yeah. depends on the region and what you did. Okay. So um, that will, that sort of thing will get people's attention. I, yeah, I can, I can understand where the, where somebody it'll who does your, that a lot would uh, get a nickname. It, it'll get your attention. But back to what we were saying about like where this lands within the morality of the time. Pretty common. A lot of states do impaling. Right. OK. Basically, any ruler has the potential to impale a dude if they commit the right crime in this, especially in Eastern Europe um, and in kind of like Middle East, North Africa. A lot of this, a lot of impaling going on. Right. And and not that they're not the only ones. Western Europe has its impaling traditions, too. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. Um, and this has gone, gone on. I think the Assyrians are some of the first people we know we're doing impaling. So this has always been a popular way to get rid of people you don't like. So Murad the second, pretty nice guy. Also an impaler. Uh, Vlad II signs a treaty with him because he's like, well, Sigismund's down. Now he's still going by Vlad Dracul. Don't get me wrong here. Okay. Smart man. Understands branding. Yeah, he gets branding. So in 1438, uh, the year after Sigismund dies, uh, the Sultan goes to war with Transylvania, with the Hungarians, right? Uh, And Vlad II has to join on his side and winds up fighting against the people he had just been governing. Now... He's willing to do this because he doesn't really have any other option, but his heart is not in it. And within a couple of years, he's like publicly, you know, a vassal of the Ottomans, but he's also covertly supporting an anti-Ottoman alliance led by John Hunyadi, who's the Transylvanian governor for the Hungarians. There's this series of battles. Hunyadi does pretty well against the Ottomans. They win a few of them. And this causes problems for the Dracul family because like, now they've picked the wrong side of this conflict, right? They bet on the Ottomans. The Ottomans aren't doing great so far. And I'm going to quote now from a bi- biography of Vlad Tepes by Kurt Trepto, who is an American historian from Miami Beach, Florida. Quote, after Hunyadi defeated Ottoman forces in Transylvania in March 1442, Vlad Dracul was called to Adrianople to demonstrate his loyalty to his suzerain, leaving his eldest son, Mircea, as governor in Wallachia. As a result of what he considered to be Dracul's treachery, the sultan imprisoned the prince at Gallipoli and ordered an attack on Wallachia. This new Ottoman assault was again repulsed by Hunyadi, who used the occasion to install his protege, Bessarab II, on the throne. Realizing the danger posed to the empire if Hunyadi controlled Wallachia, the Sultan decided to release Vlad Dracul at the end of 1442, but required him to leave his two youngest sons as hostages. So there's this kind of, you see how messy this is, right? Yeah. Uh, Sultan gets angry that he's been supporting the Hungarians, so he arrests uh, Vlad II. Uh, Vlad II's son is in charge in Wallachia for a while, but then the Hungarians push him out of power and stick a new guy on the throne, and the Sultan's like, well, I guess this family, they're still my best bet, right? So I'm just gonna take his kids as hostages and hope that that works to keep him loyal, right? Right. Um, Yeah. I think that inspires a lot of loyalty, and people generally like it when you do that. 
Yeah, that's a big, big, big fans. So Vlad and his sexy brother Radu are going to be the hostages here. Now, is this how last names happened back then? Because it feels like we're going from their old last name to like the Dracula family. Was it just a thing where people were like, actually, this is cooler? Somebody called me this? I don't think that they would have been called the Dracula family. It's more that because the dad has this title, when he dies, the one who inherits it is going to be Dracula, which is like son of the dragon, basically. Right? That's, That's the way. I was just, it's fun to use this name a lot because it's pretty fucking cool yeah so i just said vlad and his sexy brother radu would be those hostages i probably shouldn't have said that about radu because i have to note something uncomfortable here about our historian source kurt trepto so again we've got the two books i read one is by this guy who is you know it's a pretty good pop history book uh but it's not perfect and the other is this book by kurt who is definitely a historian he is a fulbright scholar um and an expert on romanian history he is somebody who certainly has the um academic credentials to back up his book unfortunately a scholar is not the only thing that he is because as i was writing this episode i came upon a 2007 article by the history news network that notes about kurt trepto quote he was sentenced to the maximum of seven years in december 2002 for invin- offenses involving two girls aged 10 and 13 who he invited oh, to his Christ. home in Lassi. A Romanian woman convicted of being his accomplice is still in prison. Trepto, who looked visibly emaciated as he left the prison, declined to comment. The historian was released early because he wrote a book entitled The Life and Times of Vlad Dracul while he was in prison, his lawyer Liviu Braun said. The book, penned from September 2003 until October 2006, was counted as community service, Braun told reporters. Wow. Braun told the court during his trial that his client had sex only with the 13 year old girl and that he did not know she was a minor so there's a lot there (laughs) oh my god that is uh uh something else yeah (laughs) i i didn't primary source here yeah it's this he is a historian he's a fulbright scholar he also wrote his dracula book as fucking community service for being a pedophile for being a pedophile yeah (laughs) you know Wow. I don't know what else to say about that, not but much. I figured I should there let is people not know. Much to say. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, Trepto's book is okay. Tro is a better writer, right? But he's not a historian, and I did find a couple minor errors in there, so I wanted to like read both of them. And then as I was writing the script, I learned that unpleasant reality. The yeah. lesson here should be obvious. Never check your work, right? Yes. There you go. There you yeah. go. Then don't, you won't learn stuff the, like yeah, this. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So in the time when Vlad II had been out in Ottoman captivity, he had lost control of Wallachia to one of his many noble rivals. He took it back in 1443, and our, our friend the pedophile historian notes that this is probably because he was a pretty popular ruler. Um, from what we can tell, captivity was not like bad for, for the Dracul brothers, right? The Draculas, the Draculi, um, the Draculsla. Anyway, they learned how to fight in the Ottoman style now. So so Vlad, future Vlad the Impaler has now learned how to fight as a European knight and how to fight as an Ottoman, right? Okay. So he gets a whole new set of weapons. He's having fun, different kind of like classes on that sort of stuff. There's some evidence that they converted to Islam for a period of time. This is unclear. Vlad the Impaler is going to like mix and match faiths a bunch. He's a little bit like... That one character from The Mummy who's just got like all the religious symbols, right? He's going to be Orthodox. He's going to be Catholic for a while. He's going to be probably may have have, have been Muslim for a while. So, you know, or he's like the coexist bumper sticker, you know? Uh, Yeah, he's a very coexist kind of guy, (laughs) Vlad the Impaler. Yeah. (laughs) So things go less well. He's, you know, while Vlad the Impaler and and Radu are, are hanging out with the Sultan, things are not going great for his father, Vlad II. Hunyadi, the Hungarian leader, is not a forgiving kind of dude. And once it becomes clear that yet again, the Mr. Dracul has backed the Ottomans, Transylvania goes to war with Wallachia. Uh, Vlad II loses this war. He gets captured and is executed alongside his eldest son who had ruled in his stead while he was out fighting. Um, is that the handsome? Or is that no, the... no, that's Mercea. I don't Mercea. think he's particularly okay. handsome. He ah. gets, so while his dad is losing this war to Transylvania, like a bunch of these boyars in, in uh, Tirgoviste, like see where the wind is blowing. And so they capture his son, Mercea, and they they kill him by burying him alive. Um, and Not there are great. there's some suggestion among scholars that maybe this is part of how that 
myth about like Dracula being being buried alive like, coming right. out of the yeah, yeah yeah exactly maybe that's part of it right I feel like if you're executing the eldest son and the next eldest is Vlad the Impaler. I guess he probably doesn't have that nickname. He yet, doesn't have but, that. Yeah, he's not impaling yet. But if yeah. he's giving off even like the slightest of impaling vibes, mm-hmm. I I don't know. If he's like trained as both like yeah. in Eastern and Western fighting and is like fighting as yeah. a knight with one hand. <laughs> he is like Jean-Claude Van Damme yeah. in an early 90s movie, right? Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> I might have just like kind of finished uh, yeah. the job, but I don't know. I, you, I say this a lot, listeners. If you are executing a family for their loyalties yes. to the Sultan, you say right? this all the time. Yeah, keep an eye out. Does one of them look like they might be an impaler? <laughs> Maybe don't do that execution. You know, yeah, keep him second right. in line. Is all I'm saying. Yeah. So, uh, it's unclear if Vlad and Radu are free or still with the Sultan. They probably are still with the Sultan when their dad and brother get killed. Um, but whatever the case, Vlad winds up going back to Murad and is like. Hey, they killed my family. I need to go do, you know, a pretty dope vengeance quest thing. I feel like I'm a good guy to have a vengeance quest, you know, yeah. all of this, all this martial arts training and shit mm-hmm. I got. Um, can I have some dudes, you know, some like some like fighting dudes, right? And Murad is like, yeah, that'll probably work out pretty well for me. Have some dudes. Um, <laughs> so, you know, the part of why this is noteworthy is that not long after his death, he's going to become a symbol first of sort of resistance to the Ottomans and eventually of like Romanian independence. He's going to get this reputation as like the shield of the West from the marauding Ottomans. Um, and his memory is used. You can find a lot of weird right wing culture warriors with Vlad the Impaler shit to this day. It's worth noting he only gets to power because he's cool with the Sultan. Right? Yeah, he's both sides. Yeah. Yeah. He's a both side, like, which is very much in line with other rulers and with how his dad had played things, you know? Yeah. Uh, and his uncle just, had played things. Yeah. yeah. You do whatever is going to allow you to survive to yeah. the next day. Yeah. It's a rough time out there. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So this works. Uh, he winds up being coming the ruler of Wallachia for what will be the first of three times. He is in and out of there several times. The first piece of documented evidence we have from Vlad the Impaler is this letter he writes right after he comes to power. It's the first documented like piece of writing that was done by his hands. And this is not like a big deal, but it's interesting that this this first Vlad the Impaler letter is written on All Saints Day or Halloween of 1448. Wow. So that's kind of cool. Yeah, the man right? knows his brand. That's incredible branding, right? Amazing. That's visionary. Just a foresight. Yeah. Oh my god. So he is 17 when this happens and all probably and he is already a hardened combat veteran. Um but he is not going to be ruler for very long. Within 2 months of taking power, one of his regional rivals invades Wallachia and forces young Vlad the not yet an impaler to flee the scene. Uh yeah. so by Christmas of 1448 he is out of power. But with that nickname, they should have known he was going to be an impaler yeah, when his yeah. nickname is Vlad the Not Yet an Impaler. You like, got to keep checking his Wikipedia film. page to see if it's, it's <laughs> safe to fuck still, with him. Yeah. Still not, but I've, no, I feel good, like bad good. things are coming for us. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's the, that's the moment in the movie. Like, they're checking their smartphones <laughs> as they wait for the battle to start, and they're like, oh, shit. It got just got updated and, like, the mods aren't reverting it. Guys, yeah. we might be fucked. <laughs> bad news. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So Vlad spent the next couple of years bouncing around kingdoms ruled by his relatives in Moldova, cementing alliances, building a base of power. By 1452, he's reconciled with Hunyadi, and he's promised to serve the Hungarians as defender of Wallachia. So he betrays the Sultan now. Um, this is a bad time to betray the Sultan, because right after he's like, nah, I'm totally team Hungary, Constantinople falls to the Turks, which <laughs> is... Not a great position to be in, right? This whole place, like, this is where, you know, if you're fighting with the Turks and things go badly, you can retreat in the direction of Constantinople. That's going to stop being an option for these guys very soon. Um, So by July of 1453, Vlad has retaken power uh, in Wallachia by personally hacking to death the guy who had usurped the throne from him. Probably single combat, which is pretty (laughs) cool, right? Yeah. Yeah. That is how I became the host of this podcast. Um, <laughs> right. Yeah. It was, yeah. uh, it was trial confirm. by combat. Yeah. 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 So Just hacking to pieces. That's yeah. right. Hacked to pieces. Yeah. So in 1450. It certainly makes a statement. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That's the best way to hack someone yeah, and, to pieces. Know, or st- rest in power to that other guy. Yeah. yeah to that other guy. To Whose the name captain we're not allowed Pike to mention of this podcast. Else, yeah. yeah. You guys will take my kids. So That's right. Mm-hmm. That's right. That's why we do it. 
1457 is the year in which Vlad will commit the first massacre that kind of starts his reputation off with a bang. Uh, Mm -hmm. As this history should drive home, there's a lot of turnover in Wallachian politics, right? His family is in and out of power constantly. And a lot of this has to do with the boyars, right? These local nobles who are the ruler's support system and his primary threat, right? Because you can't rule without the support of the boyars, but also they're always you know, angling to get someone in who's better, right? Better for them. Um, So Vlad eventually gets kind of tired of this whole game. And in Easter of 1457, he invites all of his boyars for a big feast. And while they're eating, he kills the sons of... Yeah, don't go do that! Don't go do that! Guys, guys. Yeah, yeah. somebody's like in the bathroom, like, you know, just kind of freshening up and checks his phone. It's like, oh, "Oh, shit, they changed this Wikipedia, guys! We gotta bounce! (laughs) (laughs) Oh, Um, man. I'm going to quote from called like the red feast. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, exactly. Real red wedding vibes. Yeah, Uh, I'm going to quote from a contemporary account here. While all the citizens were feasting and the younger ones were dancing, he, Dracula, surrounded them, the boyars, led them together with their wives and children, just as they were dressed up for Easter to Ponari, where they were put to work until their clothes were torn and they were left naked. So basically, he makes them build his castle, these like nobles, he like forces, enslaves them, forces them to build his castle, and then he impales them to death, right? Them and their wives, all these dudes and their wives kills the shit out of them, right? Wow. Ugly stuff. Now, there's a lot of stories of impalement from his reign. This is kind of the first one, but you're going to get a lot more. The most commonly told one is that like he wins this big victory against the Turks, and he has maybe tens of thousands of their soldiers impaled on the road leading to his capital, which is so frightening that the Sultan and his army retreat rather than advance further into Wallachia. It's impossible to know how precisely true that all is, but again, counter to a lot of these weird right-wing myths about the guy, it's worth noting if he did impale the Sultan's army, which is pretty likely... Most of the guys, if not all of them that he impaled would have been like Christian Europeans because that's how the Ottoman army works, right? Like a lot of their soldiers are these kind of like local levies and stuff often who are basically given to them as like, this is part of if you're allied with the Ottomans, you send them X number of kids every year, right? And they train a lot of these guys up as soldiers. Um, Now, it's kind of unclear how many people Vlad the Impaler kills, um, but it's a shitload. 50,000 is probably a pretty good low estimate. Some higher estimates are up to like 100,000 people. Um, And most of these are various forms of execution, including impalement. Um, But despite, again, this reputation he starts to get as the shield of the West, the majority of the people that he's going to kill are his own folks, right? Right. Um, You've got your boyars, obviously. He kills a few hundred of them. He kills a lot of purported spies and criminals and also just kind of anyone he thinks is a danger to his rule. Vlad the Impaler early on is going to be like, you know what's going to keep me in power is becoming a law and order guy, right? So he declares war on the homeless population, on beggars and stuff, indigents. He wow. gathers a huge number of these guys up and he burns them all to death in like a barn, basically. Um, Truly a right-wing hero, this guy. He is He is very much a right-wing yeah. hero. Wow. Um, he is, a, again, a law and order guy. His Royal Propaganda Bureau will spread all these stories about like, oh, you know, this merchant came to a town that, that, that Dracula was controlling one day and was like, somebody stole my gold and Dracula you know, uh, would do something brutal to get it back. Right. Like, because there's, you don't commit crime, right. There's one of this, one of the common stories you'd hear is that like, there's this watering post for people like traveling through a rural area and Dracula leaves this ornate golden cup there. And it's the point that he does. This is that like, as long as the cup is there, you know, that he's in power because nobody would dare steal anything when, when Dracula's running the shit. Right. Almost wow. certainly just like bullshit, but that's the right. story, one of the stories that gets told about this guy. The it's reality like his myth, like the, yeah. br- the good branding got him a myth about him being good at branding. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's um, a, but that, that's a cool story. The that watering is a cool story. Post golden cup. Yeah. Again, probably not probably true bullshit. because while he's in charge, there's a bunch of uprisings. People are in fact, not too scared to, to piss off Dracula, right? Maybe they should have been because these don't go well. Um, but I'm going to quote <laughs> right. again from Tro, who is our source that is not a Pet- criminal quote. 
The villages of Satul No, Hosman, and Casaltz were burned to the ground by his cavalry, and the supporters of Vlad the Monk were butchered, who is a one of these uprising leaders. A lot of Vlads. Yeah. Bod was totally destroyed. Talms left blazing, and its people hacked like cabbage in the town square. Jeez. Merchants who were now expected to sell their wares at the specified towns of Tirgoviste, Tirgzor, and Simpulung. Did you say cabbage? Like cabbage. Oh yeah. Hacked God. like yeah. cabbage. Hacked like cabbage. Yeah, just to pieces. Right. Shredded. Merchants who were now expected to sell their wares at below the market rate were rounded up for non-compliance and according to the Saxon accounts impaled by the road or boiled in cauldrons the young men to whom it was claimed had been sent to Wallachia to learn the language were likewise executed quite simply because they were clearly spies and the the Saxon the reason he brings that up is that like a bunch of these German types have like moved into Romania over the preceding generation so there's like German communities in a bunch of the cities in Wallachia and as is always the case, these guys, a lot of them become like merchants, right? So these are kind of like your upper middle class merchant class in a lot of these towns. That's a good group of people to blame all your problems on. So Vlad's going to really do a lot of murdering of these German types. And so that's where a lot of the stories of him come from is these, these especially these monks who like flee from his, you know, uh, his fairly brutal to them reign. And they tell these, they exaggerate these stories, right? He certainly did some fucked up shit, but they're also, they're trying to like spread propaganda about this guy because he killed their friends. So they're also, they're, they're pumping it up a little bit, right? Right. But yeah. does that help or do, does that just like make him more terrifying and people want to... I mean, it's why he has this rep, right? Right. It's because of these German, Germanic, like, monk accounts of his well, yeah. brutality. And the monks yeah. had the bitchiest burn books, but they also, That's like, right. were some of the only people who knew how to write. Yes. Is that right? At yeah. That time? yeah. So, like, a lot of this stuff is just the yeah. guy who was meanest to monks becomes our yeah. great historical yeah. monster <laughs> just <laughs> because monks knew how to write. Yeah, we say a lot history is written by the victors, but it's also written by the people who know how to write. <laughs> and so you've got a real advantage <laughs> right. if you're the monks in that regard, yeah. you know? Yeah. So, yeah, Vlad, again, as we noted above, he's not just impaling people. He'll boil them alive. Uh, he's got some more creative methods, though. But impalement gets a lot of attention, right? Yeah. Um, in part because it's it's kind of identified with the East, even though they're not the only people who do it. And the most infamous story of Vlad the impaling some people uh, comes after a military victory he won against his his rival with a very silly name, Dan the Third. He's like, you've got all these <laughs> wild ass Hungarian, Romanian names, and then there's just Dan hanging out there. Dan. Like, yeah, <laughs> well, all these guys, you've got Vlad the Dracul, and then like, yeah, yeah. and then that, there's Dan. Oh, He's man. the third Dan. They don't I wish last I long. Gambled here. on who was going to win that one, <laughs> yeah, Vlad yeah. the Dracul, <laughs> aka or Vlad Dan. the Impaler, or yeah. Dan the Third, <laughs> the Third Dan, yeah. the Third Dan. So he He's beats the shit cool at a yeah this Dan at a town called Brasov. Quote, uh -huh. it was here that the inhabitants were impaled in large numbers as the chapel of St. Jacob burned to the ground. According to the poet Mikhail Behem, the, the impaler sat at a table in the open air and mopped up from his plate the blood of his writhing victims. The boyer who complained of the foul stench was impaled higher than the rest. Now, <laughs> most... Yeah, pretty someone cool was, guy. Someone Maybe. was like watching everybody get impaled and killed and complained that it smelled bad? Yeah, yeah. Well, Jeez. and someone who is going to be, yeah, it's, yeah. it's fun. Yeah. I got to tell you, man, this, this place smells like shit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, yeah. yeah. All right. So most of the Wallachians he massacred are, again, Germanic residents who have come to make up a significant chunk of the mercantile class during a series of migrations in previous centuries. And it's from a bunch of these guys that we get the stories of Vlad Tepes that take him from, he's just another guy in a pretty brutal area to like fucking Dracula. And I'm yeah. going to quote now from the Warfare History Network. Dracula's atrocities in Transylvania caused a tremendous backlash in the German community, which began to disseminate vicious propaganda against him. After extensive interviews with the survivors of the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre, German poet Michael Behem wrote the story of a bloodthirsty madman called Dracula of Wallachia. In his poem, Behem describes the Vlad as dining amongst his impaled victims after the massacre. He even accuses Vlad of dipping his bread in their blood, the genesis of the enduring association of Dracula with vampires. Vlad's mm. horrific link to Transylvania is undoubtedly why Victorian novel Bram Stoker later chose to turn the real-life Wallachian prince into a fictional Transylvanian count. So that's 
one argument as to like where the germ of this comes from. And and some of the stories about Vlad are certainly true, or at least had a germ of truth, right? But the yeah. whole legend of him as this bloodthirsty monster is the result of an effective propaganda campaign, not just by his enemies. They're one of them, right? These Germans want to turn him into a monster. The fact that he is so horrifying also helps to turn him into this like anti-Turkish figure, like the shield of the West. Sure. Um, but the fact that he's so famous too, he's going to later, primarily under Ceausescu, who is the, we've done episodes on Ceausescu, the communist dictator um, in kind of the mid to late 20th century, he's going to become this figure of Romanian nationalism, right? Because he's just like your first famous guy kind of that you can right. call the Romanian figure. So the blood sucking of Dracula originated with like dipping, like with kind of a like part Tompanot? we're gonna get it we're gonna get into that okay the, there's <laughs> more to the blood sucking but the first time you've got kind of dracula directly like tied to drinking blood is this story of vlad the impaler dipping his bread in blood which again is oh, almost man. certainly a lie um, yeah because like you kill people but do you drink their blood really i don't know pretty gross i yeah. i wouldn't so i wouldn't but i also yeah. love dipping my bread in stuff and it's like such a more I, I like a nice way sauce. to go about drinking blood i mean um you could, you but also very pre- much less badass that's if, just you could good probably to know make that pretty, about you jack oh, I, I, make, I love I dipping make some bread bread out of blood <laughs> every now and yeah. then i bet you could make a nice blood gravy that would be pretty rich but probably oh, a little sure probably a little saltier than most the british like. have tried the yeah. hell out of that yeah sure. yeah they'll do anything with blood those weirdos so speaking of the british (laughs) <laughs> Our advertisers are not the British, so okay. oh, damn. you can feel good about spending your money with them. We have been working on just getting the British to yeah, sponsor yeah. the show. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's it's not going great. Um, yeah, yeah but but we'll, we'll we'll keep we'll keep pressing the flesh. Don't worry. We're back. So. Vlad is going to go to war with his former allies, the Turks, in 1459. The Pope calls a crusade, and Vlad is the only European head of state to be like, yeah, I'll do that. Everyone else is like, I feel like we tried a lot of crusades, and they, most of them didn't go well. So just, Robert, for my like frame of reference, up yeah. to this point, the wars are being waged, or like, you know, when he's going in and like taking out a rival and killing yeah. his whole town, how many people, like, is it like... Sometimes it, thousands, yeah. Thousands, uh, okay. Yeah, sometimes. Like again, so we're like talking small fifty town. to thousand to a hundred thousand total. Yeah. That's he's going to massacre in various. I remember executions. reading something about like ancient Greek warfare where it was like the towns were like, so it it was more on in line with like a high school football rivalry, yeah. like a lot of the towns and like the warring and like it was like yeah, ah, and then they like came to our town and you know it's just like these small communities going to war with one another. Yeah. Um, which I don't really have a frame of reference for because war in the modern context is so massive. Yeah, I mean this is definitely smaller than modern wars, but he is killing a lot of people. Most killing of these towns people, you're probably sure. talking dozens or hundreds of executions, but like Oh, he is go- he is going to execute tens of thousands. So like Jesus. it's not not purely like th- this little shit either. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it almost makes it like scarier. You know. Oh, it's it's, it's like pretty. I mean, it's ugly. And just yeah. Every everyone gets wiped bloodily out, bloodily murdered in a massacre. Yeah. Yeah. That's that is kind of how you have to do it. You anyone left alive that's like a threat to your your power yeah. potentially. Yeah. So he breaks his treaty with the Sultan, 1459. And part of this treaty is that every, you know, so often Wallachia has to send several thousand young boys to serve as Janissaries, right? Which is like this Turkish elite military unit made up of like the kids of their rivals, basically. And the way Vlad announces we're not friends anymore is when the Sultan sends recruiting officers, um, Vlad impales them. And then when the Sultan is like, what the fuck? And he sends some diplomats to be like, hey, bro, what's going on? Vlad feeling about what's going to happen with these guys. It's not going to go great. Vlad nails their turbans to their heads. Um, Oh, which is going to piss off the Sultan a lot. That would piss me off if I sent diplomats and somebody nailed their, their hats to their heads. I wouldn't be thrilled. Same um, time. if the- <laughs> It's cool. It's cool. Don't get me wrong. That's a cool thing to do if you're a bad guy. You know, If you're a bad guy and you're yeah. really leaning into it. Yeah. Um, also, like maybe don't send the second wave of. I feel like the first. Message feel like the was first wave. He clear. sent a message. Yeah. What did, what did we think? What, did we think that he just didn't uh, like the recruiters I specifically mean, and was well, like these silver-tongued foxes will come and uh, look, cool him down? 
I'm not going to, maybe this isn't the case. I'm not a, not an expert here, but if I'm in charge, right. Yeah. And this happens, yeah. first thought I'm going to have is like, oh, I could promote some guys I don't like to diplomats and get rid of these fuckers, <laughs> right? Like I could, I could drop a few of these dudes, you know? I've just yeah. made you my top diplomat. <laughs> yeah, you're the yeah. Uh, you're the head of foreign policy. I got a gig for you now. <laughs> so um, you, you breezed past like an elite fighting group made of your enemy's children? Yeah, that's the Janissaries, right? Not necessarily like like you're the rulers, but like basically if you're a vassal to the Ottomans, you send them some kids every year. And there's some rules, like it's not going to be your only son. If you only have one kid, they're not going right. to take that kid generally. God, okay. um, and it's not the oldest usually, I think is one of the other rules. Like they, they try cause they don't want to piss people off too much, but like they take these kids in and they raise them and train them to be like elite soldiers, the Janissaries, your spare um, kids, they'll your take spare your kids. spare kids yeah. <laughs> to yeah. train them to be elite soldiers. The Ottomans do a bunch of shit like kill this. You, maybe that's the, maybe if yeah. you, if you fuck around. Yeah. It's a weird, um, weird time, weird yeah, situation. It's, it's I cool. keep Janus trying Series to imagine are myself as one of any of these people. And it seems like, uh, and I'm not going to lie, a, a fucking waking nightmare yeah. to live at this time. Yeah, the past is not just a foreign country, but almost like a different planet. Um, it's it's really wild, bad. some of this shit. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, they go to war, Vlad with the uh, the Turks. And the thing about Vlad the Impaler that we definitely know is, by th- I think all accounts, he's a really good military leader. He's like really very good at running an army. He is outnumbered this whole time, often two to one, but he wins regular victories against the Sultan. And obviously when he captures Sultan's troops, he's got to impale a shitload of these guys. Mm -hmm. Um, But it's also the Sultan's army is very big and Vlad's is not. And so he suffers pretty high casualties over the course of this fighting. And eventually the elites back at the capital are like, so we're just burning all of this money, fighting this war that we cannot, like the Ottoman Empire is much bigger than Wallachia. We've already burnt through a lot of our army. You are eventually going to lose this thing. So let's get rid of this guy because we don't want to keep doing this shit, right? We want to we want to do the stuff that's fun, not, not slowly, slowly lose a war of grinding attrition. Mm. So they overthrow Vlad. They put his sexy brother Radu in charge. Um, and Vlad winds up having to like flee the scene after this like battle and ends up in the like care of the Hungarian king. And he's like, hey, could you give me an army to like take back power? And the king of Hungary is like, dude, you're, you and your family are the least reliable people on the planet. Why would I do that? <laughs> like, right. like wh- why would I do that? Y- you can't be trusted. None of you can. Yeah. Um, so Vlad spends 12 years as the King of Hungary's prisoner. Um, writer Mark, Mark Longo notes, quote, that he wiled away his time torturing and impaling rodents he caught in his quarters. Jeez. Maybe true, maybe not. Um, right. Fun story either way. And on brand, you know, good good for him. He's at least preventing the next plague by getting rid of those rats. Yeah. Um, I I get yeah. it. Yeah. Like, I'm, I'm not a big rat guy. Like Not a big like, rat guy. We, d- no. we did a... We've like done an article at uh, Cracked, I think, uh, where just about how like wondrous rats are. Like they're so smart and resourceful, yeah. and they're uh, also a pretty big danger, though. Yeah. yeah, even in a pet post ratatouille world, though, I would like at an instinctual level rather they all die right wow. now. Yeah, that's that's going to be popular with certain quarters, uh, now, unpopular and, with some. Yeah, I mean, like. Intellectually, I wouldn't do it because yeah. balance and nature, but like my gut is just like, uh anti rat. Yeah, I, I read too many rat. stories about the Black Plague to, yeah, to trust them. Me too, you know? I think. Yeah. So he catches a lucky break, Vlad, because his brother loses power in 1473. And Vlad uh, or Radu gets replaced by a guy who wants to be friendly with the Ottomans. Mm. Um, so with Hungarian backing, uh, Vlad is able to retake the throne from this guy who's overthrown his brother in 1476, and he f- takes power for the third time, well, which lasts about two months, after which he is found decapitated in a field. Um, Vlad is? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's, that's like that's... the ending of uh, No Country for Old Men, man. Right? Yeah. Just like yeah. having very... <laughs> Killed off screen. Tommy Killed Lee off Jones screen. walks onto the yeah. si- set and yeah. then gives a monologue if, if about aging. Mess, it'll do till the mess gets here. <laughs> yeah, um, exactly. That's a different part, but good line. Yeah. Good line. A lot of good Damn. lines. So he yeah. came back, did did power for a little bit longer, mm-hmm. and then they, they took him out. 
Yeah. Then they took him out. Yeah. It's a. Uh, it, it it's like a. Uh, you know that band, the Scorpions, Jack. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. I know it's that like band, when the they. Scorpions. It's like when after they broke up and then came back. It's just like that. Don't look up the Scorpions. I don't know if that's true. Pretend I'm right. <laughs> so. And then we're uh, all found uh, beheaded in a field somewhere. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. That that is what happened to the people who wrote "Rock You Like a Hurricane." Yeah. Um, it is also worth noting that like. You know, during this period of time where he's this military leader, Vlad, his his big move is attack people at night. Also feeds into the vampire myths, right? He's this okay. blood drinking dude who comes after you at the night. You know, at night, his brother got buried alive. You yeah. can see some of the pieces of this, but there's a lot more to the story about how he goes from this dude, who is again pretty standard, brutal Eastern European medieval leader, to Dracula, the guy recently played by Nicolas Cage in a fairly fun movie. Um, yeah. the the Renfield movie I enjoyed it has some I good didn't parts. See Got it, Nicholas but I've Holt been picturing in it. Nicholas Cage for yeah. this entire story. So. Well, and Nick Cage and Nick Holt need to be in more things together. Um, both both fascinating faces, both of yeah. those guys. So back to uh back to the story. So we're going to talk about how he goes from this European military leader to the Dracula guy. Uh, and to do that, we have to we thankfully finally get to move from the shady environs of ill-documented old history into a well-trod field of solid folklorist research. And my main source here is the book The Vampire, A New History by English professor Nicholas Groom. Uh, Groom also writes articles about Nick Cave uh, as a folklorist. This is another okay. thing he's interested in. And I think also that's pretty a vampire, based. Nick Cave, yeah, so yeah definitely cool. a vampire. <laughs> I will say, I think higher odds that Nick Cave has drank the blood of his enemies than Vlad the Impaler. Like, <laughs> right. almost certainly. <laughs> like, I have trouble imagining Nick Cave drinking anything that's not the blood of his enemies. Yeah, but, of course. Yeah. yeah. That's kind of his vibe. That is his vibe. Definitely mopped so, it up with a nice yeah. pita. And, oh, yeah. yeah. He's, he's, he's a waste not kind of guy. That thing you know about Nick Cave. Yeah. Mm. Murder Ballads. Great album, everybody. Check it out. Got a good song about Stagger Lee. Anyway. Groom, this folklorist, notes that the origins of the word vampire are somewhat controversial. Uh, it is often credited to the, coming from the French term avant pare, which means ancestor, but this is inaccurate. The term's most likely origins are in the Lithuanian word vampti, which means to drink, and the Serbo-Croatian vampir, or the old Russian word upir, both of which are names, right? Um, now, while the word vampire is quite modern, stories of blood-sucking undead monsters that can change shape are about as old as civilization. It's often noted that the ancient Egyptian deity Sekhmet had some vampiric traits, um, but just drinking blood, that doesn't make you a vampire, right? It, that trait is old in folklore, so it, it gets kind of put into vampires because we've always had blood-drinking monsters and gods in our myths, yeah. but the most direct precursor to the actual like cryptid basically monster the vampire comes from Serbia uh, where the term Vukodlak uh, refers to both a vampire and a werewolf right like mm. And it's it's worth noting, considering how often these two go together in like our modern horror yeah. stories, right? You, they come from the same origin, right? Vampires and werewolves were uh, originally the same thing, and it makes sense. They're both they both eat people, and they're both like change shape into monsters, right? Into animals, right? Yeah. Both vampires into bats, werewolves into wolves. So they started so off as like the originally same thing. Like a chi like, so I have a five-year-old and when yeah. he's playing, he's like, and then I can do this and then I can also do that. And like sometimes yes. I turn into a wolf and then I can turn, then I have wings and I have, a, and then I'm a bat. Like originally it was all just like yeah. somebody doing that. There yeah, you like, look, the winter is long. You spend most of it sitting inside your shack hoping the wolves don't get you and eating, I don't know, whatever like fucking shit you manage to save from harvest time. Yeah. There's not much to do and you're drinking. So you're going to wind up telling a lot of stories <laughs> about bullshit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And just kind of like adding stuff to it over time. Yeah, yeah. Um, now, while the word vampire, if, again, vampire is very modern. Um, this is not an old concept like what we consider a vampire. So both kind of the werewolf and and vampire myths we have today started off as these kind of like the the Vukodlak, the Serbian mythical creature, and they split pretty recently as groom writes. 
Quote, there is, however, a significant distinction to be made in the English language. In English, the werewolf was established by medieval times as a human shape changer with origins in Anglo-Saxon and possibly Old Norse culture, as well as in classical accounts of the disease of lycanthropy. The word vampire, however, was adopted in the 1730s to describe a contemporary wonder. And this is really interesting to me because the concept we have of a vampire is inherently modern. You don't get a vampire with just just with people telling stories in the woods, right? The concept of a vampire inherently bring like comes out of the sudden explosion in scientific understanding and knowledge that occurs in the 18th and 19th centuries, which come with both not just a, an understanding of like germ and disease theory, which is part of the vampire myth, right? This disease that gets spread through biting, bloodborne, but, yeah, yeah. It comes with an an, imp- an increased appreciation of understanding of like the importance importance of blood in a medical and a forensic sense, right? The 1700s is when we start to use blood to convict people of murders, right? You, you obviously, you're not doing DNA tests then, right? But right. in 1741, this English murderer, James Hall, gets convicted because he kills a guy and he can't clean up all of the blood, right? So there's like blood from the murder and it's also on some of his stuff. And this is like, I think the first time or at least one of the first times that like blood as forensic evidence was used to convict a dude. Dude. Um, was it because like prior to that just everything was covered with blood all the there time? was a lot of blood <laughs> like, yeah right uh, i just slipped in some blood coming yeah. out stepping out of my house and, well, it's and like, i don't I think, know yeah. where the blood came from yeah yeah i'm sure there were other times where that connection was made but this is right. like a famous case and it's famous it's also like really noteworthy in the history of forensics and that's part of what's going to become build to uh, us understanding vampires, right? Another key aspect, key ingredient to creating the vampire is the birth of print journalism, right? Which plays a major role in disseminating these true crime stories. The vampire uh, as a concept is inherently linked to true crime because starting in the 1700s in particular, we get all of these viral news stories about serial killers and murderers. And this really takes off in the 1800s um, because true crime has always been a reliable moneymaker. And that's a big part of this myth. Bloom cites a book published by demonologist George Sinclair in 1685, who describes the murder of a man named Spalding in a town of uh, called Dalkeith. And this, uh, or sorry, the, he, he describes a murder committed by a man named Spalding in a town called Dalkeith, and Spalding gets caught and hung, but reanimates several times, right? he They don't quite kill him successfully, so he keeps coming back. Right. And this is sort of one of the stories that contributes to the birth of the vampire myth, right? Because... It's really noteworthy. This guy this, commits this brutal murder and then he, you can't kill him, right? Can't it's kind of like the, the Rasputin stories. It gets spread a lot, right? And so people start like talking about it and it's in their mind consciously or subconsciously as they're continuing to spin these folklore stories about monsters. Yeah. Um, and it's like there, there is, I think, an under rated like blurriness to the barrier between life and death. Yeah, that, like you see even today and you yeah. know it's just like at a certain point it's like I guess they're like pretty dead, right? Yeah. Like they're they're yeah. you know, it's like you you don't know when a work of art the artist is just like done when they're done, you yeah. know. And it's like like yeah. So I yeah, it's it, it makes sense to me that that would be a contributing factor cuz it's still kind of confounding and I think something that people don't like to think about. And yeah. Like when it's you hear also, from doctors about like not wanting to do a DNR or not wanting to yeah. be resuscitated, it's because there's like this weird blurriness where you can be like kept alive yeah. even though you're mostly dead. Yeah. And it's also, you know, it, it's it's not uncommon for people to be buried alive back then. Um, and it's also not uncommon for people to commit murder. And some folklorists, there's a theory that a lot of monster myths and the vampire would be kind of chief among them, have their origin in unreal crimes by like what we now call serial killers, right? And people, somebody in your community who you've known surprises everyone by committing this brutal series of murders. It's really maybe you don't want to acknowledge that this you could have just gotten this person wrong, right? Somebody had something dark inside them that you didn't see and they committed this terrible crime. So the more comforting thing to believe is that they've caught some sort of demonic infection, right? Sure. You know, and, and you know, for a while people just say, yeah, demons in them, but like vampirism in this age of science is a transmissible infection. And that can explain how somebody can do something seemingly out of character for them. Oh, this guy that we all knew killed his wife and kids in this horrible way. 
he he's a vampire. He caught the vampire infection, right? Yeah. And because there's this growing understanding of like vampirism as an illness, there's a a thing you can do as opposed to just being horrified at this at this terrible crime. You execute the murderer, but you also have to ensure that he's not going to reanimate, right? Which gives you some action that you can take that maybe makes you feel like you're protecting yourself. Right. So you just hang some garlic around their neck. Well, and... that is one of the things that you do. <laughs> yeah. There's a couple of things that you do that play into the later myths. Right. When somebody when you think somebody is a vampire, you cut their head off often after you kill them and you stake them. Not the the initial version is not that the stake kills the vampire, but you stake them to their coffin so they can't get out. So they can't get out. That's why that's why I do it mainly. And I but I did. I only rarely do the head cutting off thing. Yeah. Well, that's part of the way you got such a vampire problem. Yeah. And that's why I'm my property is lousy with vampires. Yeah. Do you not watch the Vampire Diary series? Mm hmm. Do I have you? Have you not? Oh, uh, I mean, I'm I'm a young person who uh, is pop culturally engaged, so of course I've watched it and know exactly the reference you're talking about. Um, <laughs> yeah, but why don't you explain that reference just so the listeners know? Yeah, um, so. my, Robert and I obviously know. The Vampire yeah, I'm, Diaries, I'm, one of the best television shows of all time. The, the, uh, the, but uh, the the staking, yes. The head cutting off, mm-hmm. yes. But the garlic mm-hmm. myth. Yeah. Myth. Oh, okay. Well, I mean, mm-hmm. you would often stuff garlic in the mouth of the corpse too. Mm. You could also rip their heart out. That's a thing. Yeah, yeah. All sorts of stuff. People do a lot mm-hmm. of different shit, um, yeah. and they do it not just. This is interesting because it's understood as a communicable infection. You don't just do this to the murderer. You do this to his victims too, because wow. they might have caught it, and you don't want them to reanimate, right? So again, it's important to note. This is all very tied to old folklore and superstitious beliefs about monsters, but it's also tied to medical science. You can look at all these things that become part of the lore of how you defeat a vampire as people trying to create diagnostic and treatment criteria for a disease. Now, very evil. Yeah. It's the 1600s, 1700s, early 1800s. They're not good at that yet, right? right? Like they don't this is not I'm not saying this is rigorous science, but it is it does it is born out of an attempt to do to to think scientifically, right? That but is I mean, a key yeah. aspect to it. A lot of the modern like serial killer psychological profiling mm-hmm. stuff is also equally just uh, complete bullshit. Flawed, yeah, complete lots of bullshit. total bullshit. <laughs> so and it, it does. I think a lot of our beliefs about like forensic science working a lot better than it does. A lot of our desire to believe in like these competent hyper detectives does come out of like. The same thing as the concept of a vampire, which is that like, it's just scary that people can commit murders and get away with them sometimes. And so it's comforting if you can find an explanation, even if that explanation, a lot of it's nonsense, right? You know, forensic profiling is a flawed scientific field, but at least it provides an answer, you know? Bring the scientists in. Yeah. (laughs) Make us feel better. Yeah. Vampirism is not just people wanting to like make things seem comfortable. There are also good at the time, pretty good scientific reasons to believe that vampirism might be a real illness. A lot of it comes from the fact that rabies explodes in large parts of Europe during the time in which vampires are born as a mythical creature, right? Mm. There's these huge outbreaks. Animals will bite several people. And then those people, rabies can cause you to get violently aggressive. They'll bite people and they'll transfer the disease to those people. Right. And people who have rabies, there are certain things that seem kind of like vampirism in them. One of them, obviously, is this sudden, unexplained, violent aggression. They also have a fear of water. Right. That's noted as like a side effect of rabies. Vampires in folklore can't cross running water. Not true on the Vampire Diaries. Thank you so much. I'm glad the Vampire Diaries disagrees. (laughs) Um, So So he's just here to fact check everything for us uh, using the text of the Vampire vampire Diaries. Diaries. One of the greatest shows of all time. (laughs) That differentiates the vampire from other beasts of legend is that there is an, it is a scientific phenomenon. That is how it's seen. It is a disease you diagnose people with. It's not a, it's not a boggins out in the woods. It's an illness, right? Mm. Um, and so there's diagnostic criteria and a lot of beliefs about how vampirism worked come from early attempts to grapple with germ theory and the like. It's the result of an attempt at scientific thinking that fails. And while a lot of monsters and stories drink blood, Dracula, I think, is the first to suck it. So he's not just drinking it to get nourishment. He is sucking it and like that is providing him with like vital life force, right? And that is tied to an early understanding 
of blood transfusion, right? That st- we start transfusing blood into people in the late 1600s. Way too early. Uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we are too. not good at it. <laughs> not you do ready. not want to get I a think late like 1600s some stuff in there. <laughs> oh like boy, we're about to talk about blood. that um, because it's as soon as people develop the hypodermic needle and realize that we can inject blood into our veins, it becomes just the quackest quack here. You think yeah. these like rich people today shooting their young kids blood into them are, are quacks. Oh, let me read you from, this is from groom's book, the wild story of a guy named Arthur Koga quote, Koga, a 32 year old divinity graduate of Cambridge university was looked upon as a very freakish and extravagant man on 23rd, November, 1667. He was treated to become more docile by receiving a blood transfusion from a lamb. Pepys, who's like one of the doctors observed that the medical fraternity differ in the opinion they have of the effects of it. Some think it may have a good effect upon him as a frantic man by cooling his blood. Others that it will not have any effect at all. Koga saw the lamb as emblematic of meekness and humility declaring in Latin, uh, the blood of the sheep has symbolic power like the blood of Christ, for Christ is the Lamb of God. Mm. Good science there. How Solid medical thinking. <laughs> yeah. The lamb's blood was transfused using quills and silver pipes. Oh, buddy. Koga received a payment of 20 shillings, drank canary wine, and smoked a pipe in celebration. And the operation was repeated on 12th of December. Koga's mood was not noticeably softened by the treatment. However, some change has apparently taken place. He wrote a begging letter to the Royal Society, complaining that he had been transformed into another species and was reduced to pawning his clothes, or as he bombastically put it, he dearly purchases your sheep's blood with the loss of his own wool in this sheep racked vessel of his, like that of Argos. He addresses himself to you and the golden fleece. He signed himself Angus Koga or Koga the sheep. Wow. So this is probably a guy having like a mental health crisis and they're like, we got to shoot him full of sheep blood. Yeah, you know, what would help this. Yeah. <laughs> he doesn't feel good after this and convinces himself it's because he's been turned into a sheep man. Yeah. That'll, that'll do mm-hmm. it. Um, yeah, I have a I have a quick question for you. Sure, sure, Jack. So we, we've talked about this on uh, my podcast, The Daily Zeitgeist, with Miles Gray. Yeah, the model of vampire fangs. Mm-hmm. When you picture a vampire sucking blood, do you picture the fangs having little hollow tubes inside them? Yeah, yeah. Th- that how else could suck it work? the blood up like a reverse like yeah. snake fang? And I assume that that leads into their veins, right? Yeah. And then that the, mm. they get that blood in their veins. That's my assumption. Well, on the Vampire Diaries. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I feel like not on the Vampire Diaries. They kind of just look like pointy little teeth. It they do pop out. Really makes sense. We we've always we've like talked about where we. I think I got that from Reese's the Reese's peanut butter cup ad. Mm, um, yeah, where that is that is where I get most of my Reese's medical peanut butter most of my medical information. Yeah, <laughs> Be- because it doesn't really like I, I, we've we've asked this of a bunch of our guests, and like half of them are like, yeah, of course, that's exactly what happens in my brain, and the other half are like, what are you talking about? Why would yeah. that be it? Like you just they poke two little holes and then suck your blood. Yeah. As it said, they don't, they don't say, I want to like have my, uh, yeah, I, want, I want to suck your blood. <laughs> yeah. I want to like drink your blood and have it go into my stomach. Yes. Look, I think assuming that that line that I don't even know where that comes from. I, I think yeah. that's like, that's like car- Hanna-Barbera cartoons in the seventies sure. where he yes. probably started saying that. It's a um, fact. But yeah. I do treat that as as vampiric fact for sure. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Good. I was just I I basically that is one of the first questions I ask everybody yeah. sure. um, when they have the subject of vampire. You're known for up. this. So by the 1700s, blood is a central topic of scientific discussion, and all of these factors the, all these intellectual people are shooting blood into each other, right? Uh, there's the birth <laughs> of true crime as a genre. You've got constant news stories that are just like lavish tales of, of bloody, gory murder. You've got this early understanding of forensics, this early understanding of germ theory, all of that is going to play a role in what's called the Great Vampire Epidemic. Were you aware that this was a thing, that we had a vampire epidemic? I was not. No, it's fucking dope. It runs from about 1725 to about you know the mid-1750s. And it's basically, there's a moral panic about vampires. Kind of the same way we have it when like you get a terrorist attack and then suddenly people in like rural towns thousands of miles away are like, they're coming for us next! Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 
you get all this kind of stuff, right? Or or you'll get, yeah, you'll you'll hear a story about like a serial killer in fucking Idaho, and then like people will start flipping out in like I don't know suburban Georgia that like they're next. It, 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 human beings are not good at threat modeling. That yeah. happens with vampires, right? Okay. There's this suddenly this explosion in vampire tales all around. Europe, primarily Western and Eastern Europe. One write up on the great vampire epidemic that I found uh, by researchers from the University of Virginia credits the epidemic to outbreaks of both rabies and pellagra. So you have a bunch of rabies outbreaks. Not hard to see why someone, again, not irrational, that if there's a rabies outbreak in your town and someone's like, it's vampires, you'd be like, yeah, it seems like it might be. It certainly looks like it. It sure as hell looks like vampires. That pale guy who has (laughs) blood all over his mouth. Won't cross water, keeps eating people. (laughs) Sure. Yeah, that seems like a vampire to me. (laughs) Pale guys, not a thing of vampire diaries. Thank you so Uh much. Glad to have. They had like nice tans. What was, Mm -hmm. they just looked normal? Yeah, they just looked normal, Jack. Wow. 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 You said that like I was being. Yeah. uh, You're not you're not familiar with the sacred text. The other disease (laughs) outbreak that contributes to (laughs) vampire understanding is there's these these outbreaks of what's called pellagra. Um, Now, pellagra is an illness. It's very new to Europeans, which is why it freaks them out. Right. Because it hadn't existed because it couldn't have because pellagra is something you get as a result of eating too much corn or improperly prepared corn. Right. There's ways you have to prepare corn that we know about now in order to avoid getting pellagra. But corn has just it's the sexy new world crop that we import here and start putting in everything. And so people are getting pellagra because we're not used to corn yet. Right. Um, And pellagra has a lot of symptoms that seem similar to vampirism. Uh, You get a sensitivity to sunlight. Right. You can't be out in the sun. You get burnt really easily. Right obvious where that comes from. You get severe anemia. Some people with pellagra will crave blood. Now, again, animal blood is often used in this period in various food sausages. So it's not weird that somebody would have access to it. But like people who can't be out in the sun and crave blood, not hard to see where that fits in, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I'm going to quote from the University of Virginia here. Epidemics link rabies to a large number of deaths in Eastern Europe, where vampire hysteria was particularly strong. Several hundred cases of the disease were recorded, spread initially by rabid wolves, and then in at least some cases, people. The wolf and the vampire have a well-known link as being a creature the vampire can change into. But further, the disease is spread through biting. Victims avoid sunlight, and they can be repelled by strong odors, garlic being a possibility. The hysteria that started to spread into the rest of Europe led to the word vampir from the Serbian, first entering German as der vampire. Vampire around 1726 and later into English vampire by 1734 at the latest. As this epidemic is spreading, people are convinced vampires are all over the place. They start decapitating all these suspected vampires, staking them to their coffins. They start executing people and then doing that to them because they believe that they're vampires. And they start doing that to all their victims. So there's this, this the, the, God knows how many thousands of people get like dug up and decapitated and staked to their coffins because there's this belief that like they've caught the vampire sickness and this is the only way to stop it. Now, the, rea- the real culprit is their corn, right? It's right. corn. And wolves, as it always is in history, can't handle um, their corn. Can't handle their corn, yeah. um, but they don't know that yet because they're stupid old time people, right? <laughs> not not us smart new time people who understand diseases and always take precautions against them. That's right. Um, they're dummies, stupid dummies. Anyway, A bunch of idiots. <laughs> the great vampire epidemic of the mid 1700s is kind of like the last hurrah for believing in vampires on like a widespread cultural level as like an actual scientific illness because this kind of moral panic or hype or whatever around vampires, it leads scientific men, men of reasoning and understanding to finally reject vampirism wholly as a real disease as they gain an actual understanding about like what's causing their problems, right? So this is in this kind of the late 1600s, early 1700s, you can find a lot of quote unquote educated men who will argue it's an actual illness that stops after the great vampire epidemic. Now, The last crucial link in the chain from Vlad the Impaler to modern Dracula myths was the childhood of a guy named Bram Stoker. Uh, Bram is an Irishman. And if you know anything about the 1800s, if you are an Irish child in the 1800s, you're going to see some shit. 
Things right? are good, like, right? Th- yeah, having things a are good, good time. Famously chill time in having Ireland in the 1800s. Yeah. yeah. Um, so one of his first, he's a sickly kid. And also everyone around him is dying all the time, right? Oh, that is buddy. Bram Stoker's childhood because he's an Irish kid in the 1800s. Um, yeah. One of his first early memories is the great cholera outbreak uh, in, in Ireland that occurs in this kind of, in the, uh, the early mid 1800 periods. Um, cholera is an incredibly virulent illness that spread initially by containing contaminated water. As a result, once it hits a city, like an urban area, it explodes. And this is, cholera is one of these things, when it hits an area where you live, we're talking an end of days virus. This is like the shit we make movies about, right? Cholera is a fucking nightmare. And it hits the town of Sligo, where the Stokers live in 1832. Bram's mother, Charlotte, later recalled, One evening, we heard a Mrs. Feeney, a very fat woman who was a music teacher, had died suddenly and, by the doctor's orders, had been buried an hour after. With blanched faces, men looked at each other and whispered, cholera. But the whispers the next day deepened into a roar, and in many houses lay one or two or three dead. One house would be attacked and the next spared. There was no telling who would go next, and when one said goodbye to a friend, he said it as if forever. Because one of the things about cholera, he mentions that she's fat. I don't. He's not like trying to fat shame her. He's because that means healthy, right? If right. you're a fat person, that means that like you're 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 you've, you're nourished, uh, and it, it kills her like that. Because people, you can get cholera and be dead in twelve hours, right? Like it is, and so it has this. It is almost like a monster, like a vampire, is just sweeping through town and massacring families. That right. is the speed with which this thing kills. So Bram's earliest memories and the stories that adults tell him are about this implacable wave of death that is supernatural almost in its power and totality. And because it is so contagious, the need to there's this great need. You have to dispose of the corpses of the people that it's killing. You have to do it quickly. And because medical science still isn't great, a lot of living people get thrown into mass graves that they then dig out of or they're put into morgues. They're found to later be alive. Some of them even survive through this because they're just very drunk during a cholera outbreak yeah, yeah, and everyone right, yeah. just like rolls them into a mass grave. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But also like you can see how this is all f- filming a uh, part of a fertile uh, uh, like background for Bram Stoker, right? Yeah, He's going to have all this stuff going around in his young mind. Now, cholera is also a disease of capitalism, right? And it's also a result of the new nature of life in these massive, crowded cities that are fueled for, by products from far away. So and vampirism- the last bad thing capitalism <laughs> ever did. <laughs> right. The end. But it's also, it's kind of worth noting for Bram, because he is, when he is growing up, scientists don't believe in vampirism as a literal thing anymore. He wouldn't have been raised that this was a real literal thing. But it has become a cultural touchstone and it it becomes deeply associated with capitalism and wealth in the late 1700s. By the time Bram is growing up, he's not hearing about vampirism as this real thing, right? Because he's he's a cosmopolitan young man. He is hearing about it in political treatises. It's being used as a metaphor for the greed of bankers and rapacious taxmen, right? Because vampires suck blood. You can call a fucking taxman a bloodsucker, right? That Mm -hmm. is... His first, the the first time Bram is going to encounter vampires, it's going to be people writing about them as like a fill in for their their enemies, generally like these businessmen and whatnot. And And I do call them that the tax man. I do call him a bloodsucker every year on my tax returns. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's right. But no, it's worth noting one of the major guys who spreads this kind of the use of the term vampire to describe, you know, bankers and the like is Karl Marx. He's a major figure in this period of like the popular conception of the vampire. Groom writes, quote, in the class struggles in France, 1850, the French National Assembly is described as a vampire living off the blood of the June insurgents. Similarly, in the 18th Brumaire of Louis Bonaparte, 1852, in a reversal of Edmund Burke's language condemning the French revolutionaries, the bourgeoisie order has become a vampire that sucks out the rural workers' blood and brains and throws them into the alchemist's cauldron. Mm. And, and Marx and a bunch of other guys who are proto-socialists and so socialist thinkers in this period use vampires to describe capitalism because it's like it's a pretty good metaphor right like it's it's not and this is where if you'll notice when we're talking about the great vampire epidemic vampires aren't rich people they're not powerful people it's just whoever right it's a disease right. you know this is how vampires become wealthy cultured 
people, right, right? Right. Is in this period of time, they start being discussed in like the concept of a banker. That's why ultimately, when Bram Stoker writes his Dracula book, he envisions Dracula as a count, right? Not just a count, but like a real estate baron, right? A big chunk of the Dracula book is Dracula doing like real estate transactions, you know? He's like buying and selling that. properties and shit. Right. Yeah. Sophie, Vampire Diaries, do we have uh, yeah. confirmation? Um, they're definitely, d- it depends on how old they are. Like new vans, yeah. no. But like, yeah. the, nah. the, the they don't one, care about real estate because they can't afford it. But they yeah. do, they do seek out like foreclosure houses and like they yeah. kind of pick out like the best house in the neighborhood yeah. and then they like take it over. Um, because they technically wow. have to be invited in if it's a human owned house. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, so that part holds up. Okay. That does yeah. hold up. So a, a couple of things here. One is that. The stories that Bram Stoker grows up with the vampires, it's both this mix of like, he's a politically savvy, you know, guy who's plugged in. He's reading a lot of articles that are using the vampire as a, as a, a sort of like a, an insult, really, to describe these like rapacious early capitalists. The other place he's going to encounter vampires is in kind of some of the first horror stories, right? Um, and these are like one of the guys who is responsible for this is um, Lord Byron, right? Who in 1819 writes an article called The Vampire, A Tale by Lord Byron. And this is this is going to spread. This is a very popular story. Um, it is, uh, and you know, Byron, I think it's like wife is uh, the the lady who writes Frankenstein. So yeah, Mary Shelley. These guys are kind of like the some of the, along with Poe, some of the foundational horror authors and the vampire is a really popular story by Lord Byron. Um, And in fact, it spreads. This is kind of a little bit of an aside, but it was too interesting not to mention. Byron publishes this thing in 1819 and it's it it takes, you know, I'm actually just going to read a quote from uh, this article in the conversation, quote, the vampire did away with the Eastern European peasant vampire of old. It took this monster out of the forest, gave him an aristocratic lineage and placed him into the drawing rooms of the Romantic era England. It was the first sustained fictional treatment of the vampire and completely recast the folklore and mythology on which it drew. Now, this story is initially credited to Byron. It's later found out it was like a friend of his, this guy, John Polidori. But that doesn't really matter all that much other than that, like Byron, kind of a fame hound. Yeah. With a cool name. People would rather the first vampire story be written by Polidori. uh, Lord. Come on. Byron. Rather than, hey, it's my boy, Johnny Polidori. Yeah. J. Paul. Yeah. So one of the things that I, I didn't know until I started doing this I was familiar with like Byron and him getting credit and being by this other guy. It's like kind of the first vampire story in a modern sense. But there's actually another vampire book that gets that's extremely influential that comes out before Bram Stoker's Dracula. And it's an American response to the Polidari story, The Vampire. Right. Um, and the title of this is The Black Vampire, A Legend of St. Domingo. Uh, by one uh, Uriah Derek de Arce. Now, I think a lot of people are thinking about the movie Blackula, right? Which is a, a black exploitation movie. But sure. this is actually, this is not, we're not talking about like, I don't know, like, like, the, like this is actually a serious and influential work of literature, right? Um, and it's it's interesting because it is one of the first popular anti-slavery narratives, right? This is written in the early 1800s. It is the first American vampire story is of a black vampire. And it is also, it's, it's it might be the first short story to argue in favor of emancipation, right? Wow. This is published 14 years before Lydia Child is going to write a book called An Appeal in Favor of That Class of Americans Called Africans, which is kind of probably the first big anti-slavery book. So it, it's one of the first popular pieces of literature arguing for emancipation, right? It is not super well known, although you can find some, you can find copies of it online now. Um, I'm going to quote again from the conversation here. Darcy's narrative begins with a slave owner, Mr. Person, in what is now Haiti, repeatedly trying to kill a 10-year-old slave. Much as he tries, though, the corpse keeps reviving. Person orders the child to be burned, but the boy moves with supernatural speed and miraculously causes the slave owner to be flung into the fire instead. Before Mr. Person dies, his wife informs him that the cradle of their unbaptized son is empty, apart from his skin, bones, and nails. Some years Whoa. later, we return to Person's widow, Euphemia, who is in mourning for her third husband. She is visited by two strangers 
strangers, an extremely handsome black man dressed as a Moorish prince, accompanied by a pale European boy. He charms her with his elegance and beauty and rapidly wins her hand in marriage, which takes place that ev evening. The same night, he reveals that he is a vampire and converts Euphemia to his bloodthirsty set. Married to a monster and now a monster herself, Euphemia learns that the prince's pale young companion is her vanished son, now also a vampire. And so part of what's going on here is like vampirism is kind of standing in as like this thing that people are judged for in the same way they're judged for like interracial marriages and stuff. Like there's a lot going on in this story. It's also very much like a sympathetic narrative about the Haitian revolution. Um, I had no idea this book existed, but this is yeah. the first American vampire, right? Is, a, is this black vampire in this early pro emancipation narrative. America um, loves to forget about great shit. Yeah. Yeah. That <laughs> yeah. that's pretty cool, I think. Yeah. That's pretty neat. Seems relevant. Yeah. Seems relevant. Yeah. All these yeah. different themes. Huh. Yeah. And was it not popular at the si at the time or? It is it is it's reasonably popular at the time. It's not huge. Obviously it gets kind of like forgotten for the most part because it's yeah. not a touchstone, but it, it's not like an unsuccessful story I don't think. <laughs> um but it's not going to be nearly as successful as Bram Stoker's Dracula. And you know, Bram one of the things he he he's the manager of a theater, right? That's how he makes a job money in his early life. So he's he pro he reads, you know, Polidari the vampire he also when he's kind of you know doing this 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 gig managing a theater he comes across this book that had been written in 1820 by a british politician about the history of wallachia and moldavia and because vlad the impaler has become this sort of the shield of the west type figure and also this demonized figure by the germans this book has a lot of stories about the brutality of vlad the impaler so you know, Bram Stoker is becomes he's kind of obsessed with this area that becomes Romania. He reads a lot about it. He's also reading these stories about, you know, cultured vampires, getting these like rants about the vampires, the symbol of capitalism. And all of this kind of fuses together to create the Dracula that he writes in his book, Dracula in 1890. Right. Yeah. And that is 1890, something like that. Um, that's how we get Dracula. That's where he comes from, everybody. And that's. He's just kind of pulling a cool name from this history book that he's reading. It's too cool. Yeah, he's yeah. he reads this and he's like, "Well, that's too cool a name to not use. I gotta I gotta call him fucking." And and he's got this guy is so brutal. I want this to yeah. be a scary monster, dude. This guy's scary as shit. Like, yeah. yeah, let's go for it. You know, is the is the impaling and the like staking the vampire? Like, are those two suspected to have been yeah. linked? I, yeah, I think they. Okay. I mean, it certainly fits together, right? Yeah, yeah. And then the chocolate cereal with marshmallows, like, does it, where does that come up? Uh, well, marshmallows, Jack, are the blood of uh, uh, candy. So, oh, you know, okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That makes sense then. Anyway, Jack, that is the story of the vampire. You got a, got any, how you feeling? I'm feeling good, man. Yeah. I, like, I'm a little bummed out because. Mm -hmm. The guy did impale a lot of, like, he earned the shit he, out he, he of the nickname. He impaled a pretty nickname. good number of people, sure. Like, yeah. I was not, I, I think I'm going to stop trying to get people to call me Jack the Impaler because, like, Aww. I don't <laughs> think I can impale that many people. Jack. I just, you, the nickname that ended up sticking, Sleepy Jack the Pumpkin-Headed Bitch, is, mm -hmm. like. Terrible. It's oh not good. God. And I just wish people would stop calling me that, but. I, I'm going to tell you something, Jack, that my grandma told me, which is that <laughs> you're never going to be judged by the number of people you were impaled. You're always <laughs> going to be judged by the last person you impaled, right? And and the people you impale uh -huh. will not remember how no. many. They will remember how you made them feel. Yeah, and when you were impaling. When you were impaling them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> your grandma was so wise i, I have yeah, so many yeah. of her sayings written down They're she said that a lot up. yeah <laughs> a lot of them almost all of them had to do with impaling actually <laughs> yeah, it's really strange yeah um, uh what a what a tale um mm -hmm. there's a lot of political stuff happening in the middle in the middle there that uh i i was not fully aware mm -hmm. of of or able to wrap my head around but mm -hmm. um yeah it's Bram Stoker um mm -hmm. also an awesome name the, this Pretty is cool just name, a story yeah. full of cool names and yeah. that's and then people yeah. with shitty names that nobody remembers yeah like Dan the third what a Dan dick. the third and John <laughs> what a dick. whatever the fuck whoever oh yeah John Hunyadi I mean Hunyadi is not a bad last name but he really 
He really was fucking falling down on that first ass name. Yeah, John. Yeah. Just don't name your kids John. Don't name Dad. your kids John. Dad. Yeah. Wow. Wasn't there also a John wow. something that wrote <laughs> vampire? Vampire or van- yeah, Pol- Polidori or whatever. John fucking Polidori. Lame. Come on, I, I'm man. Gonna, I'm, look, be I'm named gonna something fucking, cool like Bram Stoker. Yeah. Yeah, or Lord Byron. I, I'm a Lord Byron truther, just because yeah. I would rather say that name than John Polidori. What yeah, a nerd. Exactly. <laughs> what a dweeb. Um, anyway. It's funny. There there are like conspiracy theories that like Lord Byron actually wrote Mary Shelley's Frankenstein and like yeah. would just like let her take the credit. This motherfucker like mm-hmm. didn't even write the one that he supposedly wrote. <laughs> no, yeah. Uh, Lord Byron. Said, yeah. yeah. Lord just Byron it. just put his cool name on things. Yeah. Um I'm sure there's some Lord Byron heads who are gonna get mad at me for saying Byron that. Byron stands, yeah. Oh, yeah. they're the worst. Byronians. I hate them. Yeah. Byronians. Yeah. What a bunch of drips. Yeah. Um, me, I'm a Dan the Third Stan. I'm a Dan Stan, baby. Dan the Third. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Dan the Third. Dan God the oh, Third. Yeah. All right, everybody. Well, happy Halloween to happy you Halloween. and you everyone get a, listening. You a know? plug jack attack? Yeah, you can find me uh, over uh, five days a week at a podcast called The Daily Zeitgeist that I record That's a lot of with, days a week. Uh, mm-hmm. Miles Gray. And yeah. um, we also do an NBA podcast uh, called Miles and Jack Got Mad Boosties. It is an official partnership with the NBA that I have to think the NBA regrets. Um, yeah. Just it's it's a very silly yeah. Um, podcast. Yeah. You can also check out my partnership with the NBA, <laughs> um, which is has nothing to do with the sport. Called, what does this uh, stand but for? Is, is an illegal gambling <laughs> operation. Yeah. So. Yeah, right. check that out too. There you go. Well, uh-huh. thank you guys for having me on. And uh, yeah, a happy All Hallows Eve. Happy Halloween. Happy, happy Halloween, everybody. Go out yeah. and cause some mischief, you know? Yeah. Mayhem. Yeah. 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 Don't impale anyone. Do not impale I'm not, anyone. I'm not going to tell you that. Look, impale if, you, if your heart tells you it's the right thing to do. Yeah. 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 Well, no. maybe. Yeah, yeah. No, I should say the thing Sophie said. No, no don't do that. Yeah, well. Don't do that. Okay. Bye. It's just there's Bye. so many people he impaled. No, You're never going to catch we're, up. We're, we're ending it. Come okay. on. I believe <laughs> it's I over. Swear. Bye. Bye. Behind the Bastards is a production of Cool Zone Media. For more from Cool Zone Media, visit our website, coolzonemedia.com, or check us out on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts.